Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Nightlight, everybody. I want to thank first Ken Quiethawk for his amazing intro. Please check him out on Google. He is a native storyteller along with his wife, and he's an amazing person who has preserved Native American history through their stories, and it's an amazing adventure. Um, please check him out. He has done an, ama- an, an amazing um, I, I, I overused the word, but and but I don't know any other way of, of explaining uh, how profound what he does is, and he preserves history in a way that goes far and above the printed word. So it's an experiential adventure, and I highly recommend you all give it a try. I have an amazing author with me tonight, and he has written a book called Unveiling Genesis, Mysteries of the Root Races and Cycles. This book um, is a phenomenal book. It goes beyond a PhD thesis. It is clearly a lifetime's work, and, and it's ongoing. It probes the mysteries of human civilization, its origin in ancient Lemuria and, Eben, and the ebb and flow in the root races like Atlantis, through to the current fifth root race and into the future. It's essentially the story of a human soul and the evolution of consciousness interpreted in the light of Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine and the Book of Genesis, drawing upon Eastern and Western traditions, Judaic and Hindu, Christian and Buddhist. The science of cycles, the yugas, astrology, and the seven rays are incorporated to illustrate the vast chronology of human evolution. The esoteric sciences are also bridged where possible to scientific disciplines such as geology, anthropology, and biology revealing their agreement, proofs, and unity. Unveiling Genesis is a vastly updated and rewritten version of the hidden history of humanity, which was published in 2005. It's got 140 figures, 108 tables, and they're fabulous. You have to check them out and hundreds of illustrations to assist the reader in deciphering our complex human origins upon this beautiful planet that we call Earth. This is a lifetime study, and it's absolutely something that everybody, if you are seeking knowledge and understanding and wisdom, this is the place to go. Philip Lindsay has been teaching esoteric astrology and the ageless wisdom worldwide for over 30 years, also working as an astrological counselor. His website is esotericastrologer.org and is dedicated to showcasing the leading thinkers in the world today of esoteric astrology and the seven rays. 
His long-term project is the ongoing The Hidden History of Humanity series of books and videos. This is an area where original breakthroughs have been made, taking him to many nations investigating and filming the ancient landmarks. The video, The Hidden History of Humanity, has, was released in 2017 and can be viewed at esotericastrologer.org forward slash video hidden history of humanity forward slash the new unveiling genesis. It's a great companion to the book. And the book is a great companion to the video. Um, it's, it's for students who are serious about looking for origins and understanding and answering those questions that we all have been asking ourselves for decades. Where did we come from? Where are we going? Why are we here? And what is our purpose in the grand scheme of all things? Now, he doesn't answer quite everything, but he comes real close. Welcome to the show, Philip. It's so glad to have you here. Thanks so much, Barbara. It's great to be here. Well, I have to admit, your book was, was an adventure um, beyond my expectations. Um, I did read most of it, and I certainly enjoyed the, uh, the video, which was phenomenal. Um, I think that, that mm -hmm. you, are, you are addressing a subject that... that those people who are on a quote-unquote spiritual journey have asked themselves over and over again, and your book really um, gives chapter and verse uh, as to how it all happened. So where, yeah, when did you um, start this searching. journey? Excuse me? I was Sorry? curious, when you, when you started this journey? Oh, well, um, with... Um, the actual book, um, I guess, in the 90s and early 2000s when I started to write it. But I, I started the project, I think, back in yeah, the late 80s, I guess, uh, where I went through all of Blavatsky's books and indexed them according to rays, cycles, initiation, uh, the root races, um, and... Then, when I brought all that together, uh, around about the year 2000, when I was in New Zealand, actually, um, I thought, right, now's the time to, to bring it all together and um, from everything that I've synthesized and gathered from all the disparate sources. And um, I, I sat at my desk for about 18 months, I think, to get the first version out of Hidden Hist which was then called Hidden History of Humanity. Um, it came out in 2005 uh, and then I was never really happy with that because it was a, a little bit rushed to meet some deadlines for conferences and so forth so in about 2015 I started working on a revised version that added all the different tables and illustrations and photographs and uh, repu uh, republished it under the new title Unveiling Genesis and uh, in 2017 um, and at the same time, that Carolyn started with the release of the video that, that I, we'd done a lot of the studio work for back in 2012. And my video editor and myself got together and, and finally produced it. Um, and it came out pretty much the same time as, the, as Unveiling Genesis. So it was a good, it was a good, uh, uh, a good coincidence. And you can watch it on YouTube, by the way. I can find it on YouTube. Uh -huh. um, and since um, 2017, when it was released, we had about um, uh, 10 million views and, and ongoing, of course. And the book is my best-selling book. I mean, I don't sell thousands of them, but <laughs> it's more like in the, <laughs> in the uh, 20s and, and, and the hundreds. But um, it, uh, I'm, I'm glad... Uh, that, well, the video exceeded my expectations as far as views went. Um, and um, the book is steadily selling. So it's not an easy book to to get through, but if you watch the video first and then if you want to go to the book, then you can. And um, it's like a, I've, I've designed it as a study manual, actually, because some of the archaic language in Blavatsky's Secret Doctrine 
now from the Victorian era is, is a bit hard okay. to break through different words and different idioms and so forth so I've um, tried to really break it right down so that um, in, into bite-sized chunks so that people can can really understand it and um, not be overwhelmed by by a mass of of, um, of words. But even so, <laughs> it can still be a little bit daunting. To um, so essentially, what I did was, was rewrite the secret doctrine according to the root races and cycles. Uh -huh. uh, so that, well, that's think... why there are a lot of quotes from Basky there. Well, I, I yeah and. I, I want to I want to just hop back a little bit because you do have these tables and and when I was reading through the book and I read a lot this is material that I just love so while it it it's so detailed you kind of want to take notes and if you take notes I found I was writing almost as much as you had in the book in my notes which made no sense. Really? But um, well. but I I loved the tables. The tables were incredible. And um, after after getting through more than half the book, I watched the video, and the video took my breath away. It the only thing I can compare your video to is there's a a wonderful video out there that 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 um, has been out there for a long time. It's called Home, and it's about the planet Earth, and. I would compare your video to that video because it's it's breathtaking and you recognize sites and it, the the, um, the the text that goes along with it the the narration is just is phenomenal and yeah. it just it makes it makes you want to understand stuff so much more and your book really really takes you right down to the basic and for those who don't understand what the root races are let's kind of talk a little bit about them so they understand um, what root races are and and how they apply to the evolution of the planet sure well everyone's probably heard of Lemuria and Atlantis and and so forth and um, the root races are relative recent um, unfolding of consciousness uh, on this planet which began about 21 million years ago so the the um, the esoteric history of unveiling Genesis goes way back before then it starts with the big cosmic picture beyond the solar system into the solar system and then then down to earth and the cycles that brought about the unfoldment of the root races so we have seven root races um, in these particular, particularly long cycles, and um, the first few root races were in the etheric, and um, they didn't really start to manifest until halfway through the Lemurian root race, or the third root race, as it's also called, and that represented the the period of time we call individualization, when humanity first um, experienced the spark of mind. Um, that was implanted, and there began the evolution of consciousness. <clears throat> and um, and in that period of time, um, human beings were gigantic in their their size, and uh, we have diminished in size since that period through the evolution of our consciousness, uh, not requiring such gigantic bodies to inhabit. Um, not long after Lemuria, that individualization period, which finished around about 18 and a half million years ago, the birth of the Atlantean root race came about. And so these root races um, evolved in parallel to one another for millions of years. Um, and I realize some of your uh, listeners may be scratching their heads right now and thinking millions. <laughs> and and yeah. <laughs> What the second chapter of my book um, is called Reestablishing Correct Chronology in World History because uh, I realized when I was writing it just how much we've all been conditioned by um, the, the biblical view of history, which, which science doesn't depart much away from, although it is making much bigger leaps uh, in the last few decades. Um, and... So I try and advance reasonable uh, arguments for, for 
for there being much longer timelines. And uh, these timelines are based on the, the Hindu yugas and, and uh, the, their, their take on history. Um, and this, I propose, is the correct history, the real history. But um, it's, it's going to take us a while to, to, um, to build our way back to understanding these, these greater cycles and, and to get past our, condition, our cultural conditions of, of what we think is, um, is the right cycle. For instance, many alternative archaeologists who do great work in the area, you know, the people like Graham Hancock and so forth, um, still don't stray outside a 25,000-year um, uh, cycle of, um, of the birth of humanity, um, which isn't really that far past the biblical view of 6,000 years ago. And so um, it's many, many, many cycles um, beyond 25,000 years. As I said, the 21 and a half to 18 and a half million year period uh, years ago that uh, individualization took place um, and the fledgling humanity began their their journey um, in evolution of consciousness and and we've gone through that third root race of Lemuria the fourth root race of Atlantis and now we're in the fifth root race which is sometimes called the Aryan the the Hindu word for noble um, and we have reached, we have developed different qualities in each root race. Uh, in the Lemurian root race, the, the basic yoga was happy yoga, the coordination of the, of the etheric and physical bodies. Um, in the Atlantean root race, the main yoga was, was bhakti yoga, the, the yoga of devotion. And in the fifth root race that we that's just culminating now, we have the uh, yoga, uh, we have Raja yoga, the yoga of mind. And um, we are going into the sixth root race very soon, where that yoga will be uh, superseded by Agni yoga, the yoga of fire, or intuition, or direct knowledge, uh, buddhi as we call it, in esoteric right. literature. So a lot of this work is based on the Ageless Wisdom teachings, which um, I, I draw upon for my esoteric astrology work, mainly the writings of Alice Bailey, and her 24 books transmitted to her by the Tibetan master Dwarf Kul, and mm -hmm. also Blavatsky, who, uh, who Dwarf Kul was, uh, he instructed her actually in that life as well. Um, the Masters of Wisdom, the Great White Brotherhood, were the transmitters of this information. And um, they've given, given us a lot, which still really hasn't been done justice. It's still going to take another century or two to really... Um, do to, to really un, uh, untangle a, a lot of this work. Uh, the Secret Doctrine is not an easy read uh, and deliberately no. a lot of stuff is hidden in there deliberately and obfuscated to make the, the student work for um, uh, work their intuition. Well, yeah, and you know, when, when I was reading through it and, and seeing the overlap of the root races and how one fed into and flowed into the next. And uh, it all made perfect sense. Yes. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, I, I just, I have always believed that Easter Island and the, and the, the Egyptians, the statues there that, that were so gigantic were, were meant to be um, literal. They weren't meant to be an exaggeration. Yes. And I think they were life-size. And um, yes. that, that's something that, well, that is always, you know, I, you know, you look at it and you think, what, what would be the purpose of doing that? That's ridiculous. That's a life-size statue. Can't anybody see that? <laughs> and apparently well, um, it. it makes yes. great sense. Well, and you, you draw that. the... So the is on the Easter Island, uh, we're about 10 meters and she says that was the height of the giants that inhabited that island four million years ago, uh, which is the period of time when um, Atlantis, the first great flooding of four major floodings of Atlantis occurred. Yeah. Well, and you also make great sense how, 
how the animals decreased in size over time, it's rather yes. arrogant to think that, that, you know, we didn't. And it makes perfect sense that um, I, I know that according to the Bible, the giants had six fingers and double rows of teeth and all of that stuff. And, and I mean, I know people that have double rows of teeth and six digits that have come down through their family line so that it, it makes yes. sense to me that at some point in time we were giants. Yes, indeed. I, well, Blavatsky says that the Lemurian giants fought the uh, dinosaurs back in Lemurian times. It sounds like a, you know, some wild science fiction movie when you when you imagine that. Um, but essentially, the those giants were about the same size as those dinosaurs, and they they actually fought them um, and um, protected themselves against them. Uh, there are various quotes that I use in my book from Blavatsky where she mentions this. And so um, everything was bigger. The vegetable kingdom was bigger. The animal kingdom was bigger. And since that time, uh, everything has shrunk in size according to the evolution of consciousness, not just the human kingdom, but of course the, the animal and vegetable mineral kingdoms as well, all carrying or expressing some kind of consciousness. So, uh, well, I think that's yeah. That that's that's really those those of us who who are in this field, you know, whether whether fifty years or just starting, the the element of where do we come from and how did this happen, and and the fact that that our consciousness was there before our physicality was there, and that that humanity went through. A period of time where they were hermaphrodite, and 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 how there was a separation at, at some point in time where there was the separation, and then there was the male and the female, and that to me makes far greater sense than a lot of the other mm -hmm. stories I've been handed over time. Sure, yeah, um, humanity were simply. Um, unconscious members of the animal kingdom before individualization. They wandered in tribes. They had had human bodies that had only just become solidified, moving from the etheric to the physical in, in that, the middle of the Lemurian uh, root race. And um, <clears throat> they uh, um, were hermaphrodite and in that three million year period I mentioned between 21.5 and 18.5 million years ago, that three million year period, uh, there were about two sub races, the, the third, or three actually, the third, fourth and fifth sub races. There were seven sub races to every root race. It was during those three sub races that um, various groupings of, of human souls were, were evolving. Some of them moved faster than others. Others had to be um, have their, their spark fan into a flame, so to speak, by the guides of the race. Um, and during that three million year period, they gradually changed from hermaphrodites to sex beings. And, and here we have one of the, the basic dualities of, of that um, we have in human evolution as we work our way back to unity and synthesis. And in fact, in the sixth root race, which is going to start in the next 25,000 years, there's already the beginning of it really, um, we will go back to being hermaphrodite beings that will match the, um, the synthesized consciousness. Uh, so we, we come full circle, if you like, from the original period of individualization back in Lemuria. So it's quite That's something to, to speculate upon, isn't it? <laughs> Well, yeah, I, you know, it's, 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 I think what, what is so mind-boggling mind but makes perfect sense is that, that all of this took place over millions of years. It didn't yeah. happen overnight. Yeah. And so many people <clears throat> think that our, our evolution, our, our um, ascension in spirit and all of that is going to happen over the next, oh, I don't know, maybe the next progression of the equinoxes, but not even that. It's, it's 
<laughs> people who think that it happens overnight. Um, I mean, I I don't That's argue right. with it's, because of you know, but but it, it it doesn't. It's a process, and I think that, that at this point in time, I feel there are people that that are getting an inkling, that have a, a sense of a greater connection to to the other side or, or whatever you want to call it, that that are able to reach that portal within their consciousness to get into some of that cosmic awareness that is there and bring it into the physicality to be utilized and, and maybe under, or maybe it's just planting seeds in other people's consciousness so that down the line those seeds will wake up and say, oh, damn, of course. <laughs> It, yeah. it just, um, it's, it's... A lot of people's think, approach to history is, is through our bad educational system. Um, ah. You know, we think that, that, that um, civilization started, what, 3,000, or 5,000 years ago? <laughs> uh, that yeah. this amazing civilization, Egypt and India, just, just came full-blown, uh, fully developed out of nowhere. No, they're, they're in fact, the, the tail end a very long uh, series of, of sub races, root races, uh, and so forth. Uh, the the Hindu civilization, for instance, started to develop around about the first sinking of Atlantis, which is where the Mahabharata story goes right back to uh, about a million years ago. Uh, excuse me, four million years ago. It, it started to develop in seed, so to speak, but it didn't really. Mm -hmm. One million years ago, uh, and when they came down into the into northern India, and and that it's, that was the, the first sub race of the. Uh, race, Philip, your sound is, is your sound is kind of going strange. Um, okay, well, to repeat it, then um, I was just saying that um, this fifth root race, this first sub race, the Hindu sub race of the fifth root race. That came into northern India about a million years ago is the foundation of all the Western sub races. From then, the, the second sub race of, of Egypt, the third Semitic sub race, the fourth Celtic sub race, and finally the fifth um, uh, Teutonic Anglo Saxon uh, root race, uh, sub race. Sorry. Then within each of those sub races, how's the sound now, Barbara? Uh, it's still very garbled. Um, can you kind of move around a little bit so you can get a better signal? Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're you're. I, I can understand you, but you're not as clear as you were when you were be, when we started. Uh, I think, I think, what I want people to. Yeah, no, this is awful. Um, what I want people to understand and what I want people to hear or my intent, I, you know, I can want, but is that we're talking millions and millions and millions of years. We're not talking short term here. We're talking a, a span of time that is beyond conception, actually. And, and, and I think that, that it, it is so important for people to understand that, that the journey we're on is a very long one and we're evolving and we're changing and we're growing and, and our awareness is expanding and our connection to higher realms is expanding as well. But that, that I mean, I, I've met people that, that have said, I'm not coming back because I'm done. And, <laughs> you know, that, that really yes. surprises me. Um, wait, um, I'm going to, no, it's really bad. Um, I don't know if Mark is still there. Mark, can you hear, Mark, can you kind of um, hang up on him and call him back and I'll talk a little bit? Hopefully you're, you're listening. Um, and see if we can get this sound better. Um, not good. Okay. Um, I can't actually, I've maximized it as much as I can already with the, my signal here, so it's probably just going okay, to be well, temporary. I, oh, okay. Well, let's, my, let's, my, 
I don't know if I can get Mark's attention. He's um, he may have gone to lunch. Okay, well we'll just we'll keep going then because um, this material is so important for anybody on a spiritual journey to understand that. And you know, one of my fascinations has been for a very long time looking backwards. You know, to pre it before before the flood, pre diluvian. You know, what happened before? What were the civilizations like before? And the fact that that you're taking everything back so far indicates that that we are just. You know, a speck of sand on on the on the on the beach of time, so to speak. But but that said, it's important for everybody to to expand their consciousnesses to the point where the the planet can become a spiritual planet. And we're not a spiritual planet yet. So that so that That's it's a non sacred planet we call technically. Yeah. And um, how Barbara, because I'm thinking nope. that you might be getting a bit of sound, but the recording may not be so bad. Okay, well let's let's hope that that's it. Um, I think that yeah. that what what is really important for I, your your book and your video are so important for people to see and to hear and to. Um, I know that your book especially is one that I am going to use as a as a study book and and I will go back when I have the time and really put a great deal of um, of insight into it um, um, the the this book is so important in that it, it will explain to you how how the soul even entered into this lifetime how the soul even came into the process and then was was blown into consciousness and then evolve to the point where we are today it's really really important for you to understand that, that the journey we're on is millions probably billions of years old and and the planet has gone through cycle after cycle after cycle after cycle and because of that um, we, we are at a point in time where we are trying to to understand our purpose here and you know, uh, on top of the fact that living and surviving is one of those things. Um, is it a better are you back, to... Philip? Is it a better sound? Oh, perfect, so. perfect. So, um, okay. so I was We're... just talking. To okay, everybody. resume. I was. Thank you. Um, I was just talking how it's so important for us to understand that that we make a difference individually, and that that there is more than just survival on the planet that we are focused at it's also the consciousness and raising the consciousness and understanding where we came from how we came and where we're going and um, it's uh, it, you know when when you think about um, I, I was I was aware that there were several floods in Atlantis I wasn't aware at the at the span of time between the four different floods um, I didn't. I wasn't aware it was that great a distance of time. Well, we've actually gives the dates for all of them, and, and this is what I spent years trying to collate from all of her writings, not just the Secret Doctrine. And um, so the first one was just after the Great Atlantean War, in fact, uh, and almost four million years ago. That was the major one that 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 just completely flooded the entire planet, so that only mountain tops. Uh, were visible and the survivors were, you know, found themselves on that high ground. Um, and then the next one was about 850,000 years ago, which was coincided with the second sub-race of uh, the Egyptian sub-race. And the third one was um, 270,000 years ago. I've got this, these in tables in my book so they can be easily sort of followed mm -hmm. through. And the last one was the famed uh, Poseidonus, the sinking of Poseidonus uh, in 11,500 and something BC, um, that's 13,000 years ago. 
so that, that was the fourth and final sinking. Um, a lot of people think Atlantis is in one particular spot and there's been thousands, literally thousands of books written about Atlantis and speculating where it is. And a lot of people think, uh, make the mistake of, of thinking that Atlantis is in just one place, the, the fabled city or uh, nation of Atlantis. And sure, there were certain places where the, the population was concentrated, for instance, in the Atlantic and in the United States, in parts of Europe, but the Atlantean continents uh, went all around the world, as did the Lemurian continents. And throughout those millions of years of sub-races and root races, those continents uh, sunk and resurfaced and, and uh, reconfigured, uh, as did the... the various populations in their evolving consciousness. Um, so, uh, and when we look at the time period you were talking about before when we had the, the sound go bad, <coughs> um, the, the age of the solar system is given as about 3.11 trillion years, and we're about halfway through that period. <laughs> and <laughs> this, this Earth is... In, its, in this this planet, in its so-called fourth globe of the fourth chain of the fourth scheme, as I go into talking about, and we're talking about bigger timelines here, is about halfway through a 4.2 billion year cycle. And some of these cycles correspond to the cycles of geology too, not quite exactly, but that's something that in the coming Aquarian age, where the um, modern exoteric science will blend and merge with um, esoteric science that will get more accuracy on and, um, in the next 2,000 year cycle that we're going into for the, the processional cycle of, of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. So um, this is uh, just, just to mention that, the, the, the fact that the Earth is part of a greater uh, system solar system, the solar system is part of a greater being again called the one about whom naught may be said <laughs> that involves um, other solar systems such as Sirius um, and hence uh -huh. the reason why many temples on, upon this planet are, are, are aligned with the star Sirius um, particularly in Egypt of course um, so the book attempts to work from the greater to the lesser um, the, giving you the big picture, which can be a, um, a little bit difficult to grasp for newcomers, and then it works <laughs> down to from the to, to the particular, to the more detailed um, account. And I have several more volumes planned. I don't know how I'm going <laughs> to do that, <laughs> but um, in, ter in terms of, of fleshing out this 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 more particular picture of of, of life in those root races and sub-races and uh, we know a lot already but there, there is more to find out and, and all the sciences, all the exoteric sciences such as biology, chemistry, um, anthropology and so forth will, are all keys to, to the, the esoteric um, uh, story. Um, and I, I think I outlined in the beginning of the book just um, what those other proposed areas of, of inquiry are going to be. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's fascinating because um, archaeologists and scientists and everybody seems to want to place everything within the in you know since since the last ice age, and there are there are places on this planet that so obviously did not take place within that time frame and yet they're they're bound yeah. and determined to keep it you know nothing happened before the last ice age and then and then everything happened yeah. and that just you know yeah. not the case and i think one of the sites that that fascinates me is gobekli tepe um yes. that 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 definitely has astrological um uh, some of the carvings are astrological. Some of them, um, yeah. the two the, the two signs that have pointers are pointing to the center of the universe. I mean, there's there there are messages that that time has left us that we have yeah. either not noticed or have misinterpreted. Well, you know, and, uh, Gobekli Tepe has as much evidence of. Um, of past technologies, very sophisticated technologies related to sound, 
Um, and some of the carvings on those stones resemble the carvings on the back of the uh, the stone uh, giants on Easter Island. So Excellent. yeah, you can find these correspondences in archaeology and in artifacts all, all around the world. And so there are many people who have done some great work in this area, um, exploring each little piece of the puzzle. Well, when you look at um the Egyptian hieroglyphs, it went, and and you look at the um, the Hindu um, graphics. I mean, it, they're telling you a story of what actually happened. You, you can't. It, it 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 boggles the mind to think that they just that all of the the graphics out there are just an illustration to some fable that that didn't happen. It was so important that they created them to leave a message to the future that this is what went on. And, yes, and very for, I, I, tradition. Well, and even, even the Norse gods and the Greek gods and the Roman gods, again, the messages are there if you pay attention to them. And if you, if you step back and, and step away from these are just myths and they don't mean anything to what is the past trying to tell us? And um, it, it just, to me, is, is there's such a richness to the, the evolution of the human spirit and the human um, culture that, that yes, we're missing the, out the on. Esoteric teaching, the esoteric teachings are really encoded in the Greek myths and Norse, Norse myths, all, all universal mythologies. Uh, you can um, find the, the Asia's wisdom teachings encoded within them if you know how to read them and interpret uh -huh. them. And likewise, in the Bible, that's why I call this book Unveiling Genesis, because Blavatsky in The Secret Doctrine um, makes this amazing statement that first got my attention to write this uh, book, that if the first six chapters of um, Genesis are examined, they will yield the history of the whole human race. And the Genesis has, is a bit of a hodgepodge um, with, uh, that's been altered and t uh, tampered with or tinkered with many times. But essentially, that's what I lay down in book one of the two books within this book, the two um, mm -hmm. sections within this book, of um, uh, examining each verse in each chapter of those six chapters of Genesis. Um, there's also a 25th chapter of Genesis that, that relates to the fifth root race, and I, I go into that as well. So, um, yes, those stories are also um, common to, to other traditions, um, besides the Judaic, of course, uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in many other cultures. And the same, the same almost identical stories, in fact, as most uh, students of comparative religion or anthropology have found. So um, I thought this is a good place to start for the Western mind because we've all been conditioned or culturally conditioned by the by being growing up in a in a, in a Christian uh, tradition where we had the teachings of the Old Testament and the New Testament, even though most of us didn't really relate to it that much. But um, it, it is a a good uh, way in for the Western mind to to understand, um, uh, and of course uh, the book holds many references, cross references to the Hindu tradition, uh, which mm -hmm. was you know basically Blavatsky's main source of um, of esoteric history, including the the very long Yuga cycles. Oh yes, and she traveled extensively too. I did. I did also yeah. notice in your book, in in your video especially, um, you used a lot of um, the graphics from Nicholas Rorick, who is, I think, one of my favorite painters. Um, yeah. He was he he was an amazing man. Um, he has a in, uh, he has a a museum in New York City, and I went down to visit it when I when yes, I lived in, in on the East Coast and I got yelled at a lot because I wanted to touch them 
and and I know that's not allowed, no. but I did it I anyhow. See. And <laughs> it, it just I wanted to feel something that came from a time um, and a place that that was more mystical than, than we have today, and and you could feel it. I mean, I I, I know that's it. I I know that. And I'm not telling everybody to go and touch the pictures because you know you'll get yelled at too. But um, but if you have a sensitivity of any sort, you can you can touch these paintings that that are of the Himalayas, that are of a time and space that that were not physical. I mean, they 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 all had a a magic to them that was so profound it was unbelievable. And he, he was an in, incredible painter. I just his his artwork is something that I absolutely um, I think I've been banned from his museum though. But 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 the artwork uh -huh. um, the the artwork so, is, um, it, it's stuck. He was married to Helena Rorick, and she yep. was the author of the Agni Yoga books which, of course, as yeah. I said before, is the new yoga for the Six Root Race. And, um, mm -hmm. and they, they traveled uh, for four and a half years on an epic journey up into Tibet and China. Um, extraordinary uh, journey that was, it was detailed in several of his books um, where they met the masters too, of course, and had extraordinary experiences along the way and where he oh, yeah. uh, got a lot of interest for his paintings too, of course, and probably painted quite a few, few there. So they are a, a part of the um, Asian's wisdom tradition. It's very important. The Agni Yoga books are very intuitively written. Um, uh -huh. they, they appeal directly to the heart, to the intuition. Um, they're not so technical necessarily, but some, some of it is, is complex given the, the fact that, that it is uh, esotericism or occultism, um, and um, so it's not for everyone. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, it, I don't know who said it, but, you know, with the eyes to see and the ears to hear, um, I think that, that there is a magnetism that, that attracts people who are ready to be open to the magic that is there. And... Um, I, I just, um, he fascinated me. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I, I, I think the yeah. fact that he, he traveled on donkeys in the Himalayas, he visited um, temples that, that were high up where the, the air was clear and clean, and he, he visited uh, a few that, that they even had, you know, I, I know that the, they, they don't have, guest books that everybody signs but but in one of them especially they had a, a record of the fact that jesus had visited there and you know sure. they showed it to him and um again the the teachings of that tradition are so profound and and they're obvious in the teachings of jesus this is as well as the druids so um as you said um the the stories go back through time and they're repeated over and over and over again and they're not necessarily because they're in my opinion that they're being copied it's that the, the the message is being repeated over and over and over again through time to remind people of a philosophy and a way of life that is important to share and to, to um, embrace yes so but I, I just, I, I absolutely, um, when, when you look at the, um, the Hindu texts and you look at, you, you look at the Vimanas and you look at, I mean, everything there actually happened. It isn't a story. Right. And, and, and Plato was not a science fiction writer. He was a philosopher. <laughs> so, That's right. So, well, the Vimanas... Right. For your listeners who have not heard of that word before, were were spacecraft. Were they had that technology back in the Atlantean War four million years ago? It has been around for a long time, 
and of course there's the uh, the various books and diagrams of what those crafts can look like that, that you can find in various books and and online. Um, Plato, of course, was a was a, an advanced initiate. He was an avatar, really, for the fifth root race in many ways, um, and um, his stories are have been taken literally, um, and they can, but they can be interpreted on two different levels. Um, the nine thousand years that he talks about uh, before his time relates to the previous, the, the fourth and final sinking of Atlantis that we referred to before, but esoterically read, 9,000, Blavatsky says, is 900,000. And 900,000 yeah. years before his time was around the, the third uh, flood, 850,000 years ago that I mentioned before, and so on. Um, and so because of his book, many people have um, tried to identify Atlantis being in one place. Uh, I, I think I say somewhere in the book that um, that in fact there were there were templates for designs of cities that were repeated in different places where he gives the measurement of these cities um, um, and you can find them in various places in in Greece uh, even in Bolivia there's one author who's made a, a, a great argument for a particular place in Bolivia near near Lake Titicaca in fact. That, um, that takes all of Plato's descriptions and applies them to that particular area of the world. I think I've seen about four or five different theories of, of applying those um, those measurements, those physical measurements, to to different geographical areas. So, um, you know, there was uh, you know like a like a, um, a, a standard sort of template design for for cities. That incorporated probably sacred architecture, uh, protection, and all sorts of things for for various populations. But the um, at one stage, basically, there were continents and islands stretching right across the Atlantic from from um, the Americas to to Europe. Um, there was a large continent that stretched from from southern Europe right across to to northeast, what we call Brazil now. Um, mm -hmm. Those those continents sunk, changed. They were known by various names. In fact, they're called various names in the in the Hindu scriptures. Um, you could go across the Atlantic by island hopping, basically, from one small island to one large island continent to another large island to another continent. And, and uh, they, most of the United States up to the Rockies was pretty much part of, um, from the East Coast to the Rockies, uh, Rocky Mountain Range, um, was one of the major chunks of Atlantis. And there was a lot of the Atlantean energy left there. Likewise, in, in Brazil, in, um, in the northern part of South America, uh, but that country also was part of Lemuria in an earlier stage, as was the west coast of the USA, was uh, an ancient part of Lemuria at one stage. Uh, we have Easter Island, of course, uh, out there uh, west of, um, of Peru and so forth, that was part of the Lemurian continent, which stretched all the way from South America across to Australia, and even across to Africa, through the Indian Ocean to Africa, at one stage. And, and New Zealand and Australia are the, some of the main remnants of Lemuria. Australia is the oldest remnant of Lemuria. New Zealand is a, is a younger remnant of, of Lemuria. Um, so, and all the islands that stretch across from New Zealand to South America are all part of a huge continent that span right across to that to the South American continent. And all of them have have artifacts and statues and so forth that that all tell the similar story of of and also languages. Today, there are there are many um, similar languages between the islands that have had no contact with each other indicating the fact that it actually was one massive continent at one stage where there was one language. I think one of the, the fascinating parts of, of the video 
especially was how you showed how um, with the with the the tilting of, of with the moving of the poles and with the the flipping of the uh, of the of the poles themselves, which is going on on a pretty regular basis. It's just such a large schedule that we aren't we we have no knowledge of it. That that um, at some point in time, uh, you, you know, the the the, the top topographics of, of the planet have risen and fallen tremendously and how how they, they are doing so now and at, at some point in time into the next route race that that Great Britain will probably be underwater and um, the mm -hmm. center the center of um, the, the the spiritual religious will um, will be in South America which makes great sense yes well, it's um, Brazil is well, what we now call Brazil because in 25,000 years' time, there'll be uh, it will have amalgamated probably with other countries in, in there, and there'll also probably be uh, by that time uh, other land masses will have risen and, and parts of South America will have sunk. But it will be the the uh, home of the first sub race of the six root race. And it's going to be a synthesis of all races. This is what's occurring now already in the sixth sub-race of the fifth root race. The sixth sub-race will be the seed for the sixth root race. And um, so we're seeing a synthesis in this last couple of centuries of, of the entire world now. Um, every ethnic minority or majority is in most Western countries. And this will continue. And the United States is meant to be a bridge between the the, uh, the fifth root race as, as represented by Britain and, and Europe uh, to the sixth root race, which is going to be in, in South America. So um, I've written several essays about this that you can find on my website, but I, I do touch upon it in the, in the video and in the book too. Um, so well, that's, we're, that's we're looking we've, we've we're looking forward like. 25,000 years, right? We're not looking tomorrow. Well, it's it's starting already. In, in there are communities and and um, um, sort of anchoring of spiritual forces already uh, in mm -hmm. South America. So, you know, South America was the the site of the original Shambhala, which is the spiritual center of the world. There have been three locations of Shambhala, and I've, I've done some presentations about this. Um, and so, basically, that was the original Shambhala where the guides of the race taught hum uh, fledgling humanity and where the, if you like, it was the crown chakra of the planet. And um, so the sixth root race is, is going to bring about the reactivation of that, that center, um, which has lain virtually dormant for, for millions of years. Uh, I think it's already awakening, actually. Um, the second Shambhala was in Central America, in the ancient Mayan um, uh, civilization. And the uh, third Shambhala, which is the one that's the most active right now, is in the Gobi Desert, in etheric substance, and which, of course, many people have said that they have visited in meditation or dream experience. Um, it is where the Lord of the World, Santa Kumara, who is what we call technically the, the personality of the planetary logos or God um, is anchored and who transmits the purpose and the plan, the planetary plan to humanity via the masters of wisdom or the great white brotherhood and the various ashrams which they preside over uh, in which uh, the disciples, aspirants and initiates who are part of humanity. And so the, the plan is transmitted from the, the greater to the lesser. Um, and in fact, um, 2025, there's going to be a Shambhala, a centennial Shambhala conclave, as it's called, in the council chamber of Shambhala, as it's known, between some members of the Great White Brotherhood, the senior members, including the one that they call the Christ, who, who has the office, holds the office of the Christ, um, with 
Shem, uh, with Santa Kamara at Shambhala, determining they will make a decision, which I've written about extensively in my newsletters, um, of when to re-externalize amongst humanity again. Because back, way back when, in, in the four million year period, uh, period of the destruction of Atlantis, um, was when the Great White Brotherhood had to withdraw from human contact and have only been working behind the scenes ever since due to uh -huh. the triumph of the so-called forces of materialism. So now with their expected, uh, their imminent return, uh, probably in this century sometime, hopefully sooner rather than later, those forces are massing to do everything that they can to block the externalization hierarchy. Uh, and this is where we find ourselves today, where the forces of materialism are really uh, fighting tooth and nail. Uh, this is their last gasp in many ways, uh, because um, the, the planetary plan is going ahead. It will succeed. It might be delayed by a century or so, but it, 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 it will uh, prevail, and humanity will reach a point uh, that they've never been to before, and that is complete freedom from the um, from the uh, influence of the forces of materialism, or the forces of darkness, if you like. Uh, the uh -huh. war that was fought in Atlantis was all about that, uh, and it was recapitulated during World War One and World War Two. And I currently see CS is being in the third and final phase of that conflict, which is mainly working out upon the mental plane at this point. Um, hopefully it doesn't precipitate to a physical war. So we find ourselves between the ages of Pisces and Aquarius, this 500-year cusp of cycle, um, where there is always on the cusp of, a, of an age much conflict and chaos as one energy is substituted for another energy. Uh, we're also on the cusp of two ray cycles, this, the outgoing ray cycle of uh, the sixth ray of devotion and idealism, which has characterized a lot of the Piscean age, uh, and the incoming seventh ray of ceremonial order or magic, the ray of organization. Um, so we are literally at sixes and sevens with ourselves at the moment on this part. Plus also, we're on the cusp of the root races, or at least of the sub races, within the fifth root race, which is going to be the seed for the sixth root race. So we have ex we are at an extraordinary period of time um, in our planetary history. And oh, yeah. if you watch the video and read the book, you'll get more of a sense of, of you know where we have come from and where we are now and where we're going to. Well, I think the, the other part, too, that, that is, is made for me anyhow, um, a lot clearer is the fact that, that astrology does figure into all of this. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Pisces with Aquarius rising, and I could so relate to so much stuff that was going on here that it was like, of course. <laughs> um, your, your book is, you know, I, I absolutely, you know, I'll say it again and I'll say it often, I highly recommend this book to anybody on a spiritual journey. And yes, you're going to have to work and you're going to have to study, but that's the point. Um, <laughs> Your and, and horoscope it, has a, a blend of the two ages, uh, Barbara. You have a Pisces personality, but your sole purpose is Aquarius rising. So you are yeah. able to, in your work, bridge, bridge the two ages in, in the work that you do. It's, it's interesting you say that because somebody asked me if I could describe what I what I was and what I was doing, and I said I call myself a bridge walker between the physical and the spiritual, and I try hard to stay in the middle of the bridge. <laughs> and and that's, that's actually. I'm sorry. That's the task for all of us, isn't it, to to try and bridge the the esoteric um, teachings which are almost ungraspable for the, for the majority of humanity uh, and, and seemingly fantastic or, or um, of, of the imagination or of fantasy to, to bridge those, those basic tenets to, um, 
to the outer world. And not everyone's ready for it because everyone's at different stages of evolution. Humanity are just waking well, up in the last century or so in terms of, uh, of taking initiation, the, the first initiation. And that that is that is accelerating, that process is accelerating now. Well, that's, that's the purpose, actually, of Nightlight was people laughed when I named the show what I, I don't know, 2009. I think the show started. Um, it, it was to it was to provide a, a beacon of light for people who were searching, and that's that's what we try to do. And and having you on the show is certainly you know upping our wattage tremendously. So um, <laughs> I, I I just I, I am so delighted that. Um, I found your book, or your book found me. I'm not sure which it was, but it's <laughs> it's important that that uh, we we put information out there, and you know, I I know that people who need it will find it, and um, sure. that's that's the important part of it. You know, trusting that 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 the magic pulls people to to you. Um, one thing that, that that I mentioned in the intro that I think. Um, it's important to understand what, what soul-centered astrology is, and I did mention it yeah. someplace, I think. And and you want to give because most people know, you know, an astrologer what they do, and uh, but yeah. but what you do is so much deeper than that. So you can kind of fill people yeah. in on what that is. Well, esoteric astrology is the science of one sole purpose, which is determined by the rising sign, and it, the rising sign is determined by your exact time of birth. So the soul chooses the month of incarnation, which is where your sun sign is going to be, and, and that's your that represents your personality, your threefold lower self, mental, emotional, and physical. But it, the soul also chooses the time of, um, uh, ideally, of incarnation to get the right rising sign that, that uh, they want to develop that quality. Uh, usually a person, we're told, has the same rising sign for seven incarnations in a row to, to develop that quality. Um, and so in exoteric astrology or personality astrology, the rising sign is seen as the personality and the sun sign is seen as the spirit. It's actually the reverse of esoteric astrology. Um, but when you understand um, that the soul chose the sign on the eastern horizon uh, at the exact time of birth to develop that quality, you understand, you, you get a, an understanding of, of why the sun is actually the personality expression of the horoscope. And esoteric astrology is the science of the seven rays, and most people do not know their rays. I have a lot of tabulations on my website and essays about the rays, and I mention the rays constantly in my newsletters. And it can take a while to figure out your rays. They don't just come tumbling down like balls on, uh, for, for a lotto on, on Thursday night. I wish that could be the case, but they take a fair bit of um, study to, to discern the, uh, the qualities of the rays and then reflection and intuitive ref reflection upon them. Uh, and it can take years to figure them out, uh, to figure out one's ray structure, as we call it, the, the soul ray, the personality ray, the mental body, emotional body, and physical body rays. Um, we can have as many as five rays in our makeup. Um, we can have the same ray in a couple of our different personality vehicles. So the rays are ruled by planets. The signs are ruled by planets. The chakras are ruled by planets. And so esoteric astrology tries to blend the the things that these different fields have in common by the planets. Um, so you can see it's quite an intricate science. It, it, it is a science, as is personality astrology, studied by serious humanistic astrologers, for instance. It's in the, in the hands of a, of a good practitioner. It's, uh, they do excellent work. So esoteric astrology doesn't necessarily try to say that it's better um, but it, we have been given techniques in the book by Alice Bailey called Esoteric Astrology um, uh -huh. that differ from what we already know. Um, and the, the various signs of the zodiac 
have um, not only a personality ruler or an exoteric ruler, but they have a soul ruler or a esoteric ruler. And if a person is sufficiently unfolded in their consciousness, then they will be starting to respond to the esoteric ruler. For instance, Uranus is the ruler of your Aquarius ascendant, um, but Jupiter is the ruler of is the soul ruler of Aquarius. Um, Uranus is the ruler of the seventh ray of ceremony and order of magic, and Jupiter is the ruler of the second ray of love wisdom, which is quite possibly your soul ray, but you cannot get the rays from the horoscope. The horoscope is simply an interface for the expression of the known rays, the known and intuitive rays. So, um, is when I do a reading, I, I, um, I look at the esoteric ruler of the ascendant and its relationship to the rest of the, the chart, but personality integration issues, of course, which we all have, um, karma, um, and the crystallized patterns we've brought in with us from other lifetimes that we need to work on and resolve. Um, all those things constitute a, a reading, and there is no end to how much we can learn this. As a joke astrology, the book has an incredible amount of subjects in it that have hardly been tapped into yet by students of astrology. Uh, it will take, like I said before, centuries to really uh -huh. um, extract that information and apply it in, uh, practically and, re and realistically. So, um, and so these books were written back in between 1919 and 1948. Uh, so they, um, uh, it's quite a, a large body of knowledge. We're, we're even told that some of the masters themselves are still studying some of the, the more advanced book in, books in the series. <laughs> so that, that gives okay. you some idea of the depth of, of some of the material, for instance, the Treatise on Cosmic Fire, which is about almost 1,400 pages, is an extraordinary book um, that many are drawn to. Um, the Rays and Initiations, The Externalization of the Hierarchy, which is the one that I'm rereading at the moment, I'm finding a lot of inspiration from because it was written during World War II and pretty much describes the externalization process that's going to take place in the next century with, when the Masters of Wisdom come back and literally walk amongst humanity again. Um, and the externalization of the, ash, the ashrams by their aspirants and disciples will precede their eventual return. And this is, um, this is the era that we're going into right now. So in 2025, when they have their, their, the Council of Shambhala Conclave, uh, they won't be returning on that year. Uh, they'll be making a decision about when they will return. And in some of my newsletters, I speculated that could be as late as 2080 or, or 2100. Um, but it might be a lot sooner, depending on, on the need. One of the things we have to remember about the, the Great White Brotherhood is that they cannot interfere in human free will. They can only inspire humanity, um, but there are certain karmic, cosmic laws that they can't go past, um, and they have to allow us to make our own silly mistakes quite often um, as we <laughs> slowly move forward uh, in our evolution of consciousness. Um, yeah, I, I, I hit a lot of those brick walls, yes. <laughs> haven't we all? That's right. It's, um, uh, and, and so I, when you read the books, you can get a sense of the humility that's really required because humanity does get quite cocky at times and, and ahead of itself. Um, of course. And uh, they can't bring you down to earth a bit. I, I tell people that, that every now and then I try to go with the flow, but every when, when I'm so sure not, certain that I know where I'm supposed to go, I, I basically say, I'll take it from here. I know where you want me to be. And then I hit a brick wall. So um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's you know, and, and I see it coming. I know when it's, I, I know when it's happening exactly. I almost hear laughter, you know, kind of like, oh, God, she's going to do this again. Um, so... 
but with the Great White Brotherhood, I, I get the feeling that they are, while they are not here, they are more available than they've ever been before if one, if one takes the trouble to try to connect. That's true, I think. Um, basically, their, their reappearance their, or their return or their externalization has already started since World War II. Mm -hmm. um, when the one who held the office of the Christ made a, a decision. Um, and and so their gradual approach to humanity is also contributing to the chaos and conflict that we have on the planet because their highly refined frequencies uh, are clashing with the status quo, with the, the lower material forces that we inhabit. Um, and that's why we are at such a crisis right now in the world. Um, it's bringing up the shadow of humanity to deal with the, the, the shadow or the dweller on the threshold, as we call it in occultism. Um, that's what humanity is going for. And this must be a process that all of humanity goes through before they reappear. It's really purge, a, a purging process, which, of course, uh, Pluto and Capricorn has been bringing on for the last 10 years. Um, well, I, th and we'll I think, too, one thing that, that, that humanity has to understand is that you can't build greater unless you tear down the lesser. So that, yeah. so that there, there's a need to let go of what you perceive as security because it creates a prison. That's right. I mean, we're so, looking at the crystallization of the Piscean Age. And um, uh, at the moment, most of humanity are still in the Piscean Age, in this 500-year cusmal cycle. A very few, we are told, are in the Aquarian Age proper. And then there's a group, a large group in between those two extremes that, that um, you know, are pulled between those extremes. Uh, and, and therein is the, the chaos and confusion. Um, everything turned upside down, inside out, and back to front of right now, especially mm -hmm. in the last two years. So, um, uh, yeah, their, their approach is certainly stirring stuff up, particularly on the astral plane, which is the major mm -hmm. testing for most aspects and disciples on the path is, is working with the control of the astral body. Once that is um, achieved and the, the so-called second degree initiation is taken, which is a very advanced stage of unfoldment, the higher initiations um, come much more quickly. And I'll just say a word about the initiation. It's a, a, an artificially imposed um, system of, of speeding up of consciousness on this planet that was brought about because of um, this planet lagging behind the evolution of the other planets in the solar system. Uh, there are seven so-called sacred planets that have reached their point of, of perfection, and there are five non-sacred planets of which the Earth is one. So we've fallen a long way behind due to a failure of, the, um, uh, of a particular uh, globe, as it's called, in a previous Earth scheme incarnation billions of years ago. And, in fact, the moon in the sky that we see today is the remnant of that particular globe and it still has this karmic connection to us through its gravitational uh, relationship to the Earth. Um, and, and so the process of initiation, I've often likened it to those Japanese trains where you've got those guys with the long white gloves on the platform just pushing everyone into the carriages so they're just jam-packed in there like sardines. Um, yeah. That's the kind of forcing process that's going on and, and has been particularly picking up between 1965 and 2025. This is the time of the forerunner, as, uh, as they call it, as John the Baptist uh, once called himself. And it's a similar thing happening now, the forerunner before the externalization of the hierarchy. And so everyone has to, is being pushed to step up their game you know, and to make a stand, um, to to take back their power, um, to awaken from the mass consciousness into individual, independent 
discriminative thinking. And we see this happening all around us right now. It's very encouraging. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I, I tell people that the globe is going through a birthing process. And for anyone who has ever birthed, um, it hurts. So that, so yeah. that it's, it's, it's not an easy flow. It's a um, painful one, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to, uh, as far as the globe goes, it doesn't have to be a painful one. But, but in a way, I think emotionally it is because there's a, there's a shattering of preconceived notions as to your, your, your purpose, your direction, your, you know, your source. Sure. And it, it's a matter of reconfiguring internally on, on a spiritual level holy mackerel, there's so much more. And, you know, frankly, I'm excited by it. Um, but but then I'm strange. Well, you know, um, so, it's been described by the Tibetan master, Dwarf Kool, as this sphere of pain and suffering unique in the solar system. I'm paraphrasing here. But um, so there is some unique karma working out on this planet. And we attract uh-huh. a lot of attention from other civilizations, from other worlds. Uh, we see a lot of UFOs, and um, which have been, of course, very extent since uh, since World War Two uh, sightings. Even a friend of mine the other night had, had a major sighting in the United States. Um, they are watching uh, and and waiting. And, um, mm-hmm. uh, of course, you're aware of the work of various people like Dr. Stephen Greer and the uh, Disclosure Project. This, well, is, this could totally, well yeah. be disclosed in our lifetimes. And um, they are watching with considerable interest what's going on on this planet, which is uh, the Tibetan Master also describes as our, our, something like our, our unimportant planet. But at this particular time in, in solar system history, um, there's a lot going on that the rest of the solar system is in some ways uh, waiting on. You know, for for this sake, this this planet is already a sacred planet in some respects, but that hasn't externalised from the inner to the outer yet. And when it does, no, I... it it will make the configuration of energies between the other planets in the solar system, the the body corporate as a whole. Um, that will usher in, that will benefit all the other planets as well, uh, and also be on the solar system to those seven other or six other solar systems that are part about of this so-called greater cosmic being we call the one about whom naught may be said. So mm-hmm. we are living in an extraordinary time right now with um, and going into this Aquarian cycle. I've often I've often said that I felt that for some reason the planet had been quarantined until we could get it right or 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 pass through whatever stage and, and I, I, I think we're quarantined so that we don't infect the rest of the the whole planetary system. I do feel we'll get it right. I do feel we will get to a place where we will click in and become a part of a greater consciousness out there. But um it, it, it's an interesting and, and, metaphor, but, you know, each planet has within it the microcosm of the whole solar system. And this is mm-hmm. where the glow chains in each planetary scheme. We are the Earth scheme, okay? But this mm-hmm. planet that we inhabit now is one globe of one chain amongst seven chains within that scheme. This is something I try and explain in the video and also in the book. Um, we've come from a previous globe in this chain, uh, the globe that failed that I told you about, and yeah. already the, the karma being generated on this planet is being built into the etheric structure of future globes, the fifth globe, the sixth globe, the seventh globe of this particular uh, Earth chain. and in a sense, it's it, what I was going to say before about the root races, they unfold similarly to the globes and chains in terms of not so much linear pattern that the Western mind tends to put it in. I put my 
made a lot of tables, which helps the Western mind in that linear sense, but we can think of time more in terms of spiralic time, um, and and hence the um, the correspondence to to um, the fact that there is no time in some some respects. That we can measure time in these particular cycles that have so many years and the yugas and the cycles and so forth, um, but when we understand the nature of spiralic time, that is getting closer to the, to the reality. And, and that's, that's a huge thing to comprehend, the, the true nature of time. Um, in this Western uh, civilization, we have developed a concrete mind to the nth degree, and we tend to materialize everything that we look at, take literally, for instance, the the 12,000 years of the Hindu gods, which actually has to be modified by about 360 to get the true figures. I discuss this in my book as well. But um, mm -hmm. And so we have to really go into the abstract mind, the higher mind, which is the, the seat of the soul, um, to to really touch upon the, 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 the real verities, the, the truth. Um, and this this dweller on the threshold that I discussed before, is humanity dealing with the shadow of the concrete mind that we've, we've developed to such a, a high level in this fifth root race, the, the fifth race corresponds to the fifth plane, the mental plane. Um, you can find all these correspondences in the septenaries. Um, we're facing the shadow and, and um, as we move in to develop the higher consciousness of, of intuition in the six root race. So um, you, there's this great grinding, if you like, of, of wheels against each other in this particular period of cycles of, of, um, of mind, of ideas and so forth. And, and it, it all has to break down before it can um, be rebirthed in the Aquarian cycle. <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, a we're very told that most time, you know, to be here is um, is emotionally polarized, is astrally polarized, still has Atlantean consciousness. This is what we're told. Yet those few the uh, minority of humanity which have reached the the acme of development of mind in the fifth root race, they they kind of hold it for everyone. Um, in a positive way, but also in a negative misuse of that energy as well. And, and but what's happening now is that um, especially in the last few centuries, the consciousness of humanity is developing so quickly that it is catching up and becoming far more mentally polarized. Um, we also have to remember that um, there are two types of humanity, two two main groups of humanity on this planet. There is the so-called moon chain souls and the earth chain mm -hmm. souls. The moon chain souls were the ones who inhabited the, the, the moon chain, the previous globe to this earth chain, that was basically um, a, a failure and had to be held over in a pralaya intermediary state for millions, if not billions of years, before they could come back in again on this earth chain. And... Um, so what we had back in the individualization period of Lemuria were earth chain souls who were, ne who were never part of the moon chain, who incarnated first. And then the earth chain souls had to wait several million years for the, for the um, uh, excuse me, what did I say? No, I, I better say that, start again. The moon chain souls had to wait for several million years while the earth chain souls caught up in their mental consciousness um, expansion. And not, of course, anywhere near the degree of the moon chain souls, but nevertheless, the moon chain souls uh, incarnated in the third subrace of Atlantis. Hey, I do apologize for the kind of the backing and forthing and everything. However, his information is so crucial that, that I want to make sure that you people get it and, and, and you're able to work with it and put it to use within your lives. Um, I, I think one of the, the really 
important things to, to, to get from all of this material is that we're, we're, we're small cogs in, in a huge wheel, but at the same time, everybody is important. Everybody is crucial. And it's, it's a matter of, of making sure that you understand that, that you're important and that the, the work you do on yourself is important because it, it adds to a greater, it, it's sort of like you're a single ripple, but if enough ripples get together, they become a swell. And then the swell becomes a wave, and then the wave becomes a tsunami. So, so please don't Let's forget that, that you are. Hey. Hi. Or, I, think you have, I think you have a guest back. Yay. How are we? Uh, this is. Yes. Yep, you're fine. You're, you're much better. You're getting too much truth out there. <laughs> so um, we've got about half an hour left, Barbara. At the, yeah, at the most. Yeah, about half an hour. Yeah. But I was, I so was, I was, I was, speaking, I, was I was telling them that that it's important for everybody to realize that that their voice matters, and that what they do with their life and their and the development of their spirit and understanding their purpose in life means something and that that if each person took took care of themselves that that they would create a ripple that would be you know become a swell that would become a wave that could become a tsunami that will change the change the planet and change the destiny of humanity as well yeah that's a very good get, way to put it i'll get off my soapbox <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, when I was saying before about the Earth chain and Moon chain souls, um, the one who holds the office of the Christ, the one who overshadowed the Master Jesus in Palestine 2,000 years ago, um, was of the Earth chain humanity. The one we know as the Buddha now was of Moon chain humanity. Um, ah. And so... When Atlantis was up and running, so to speak, in the, about the third or fourth sub-race of Atlantis, they both were in the same ashram and took the third initiation together in that ashram. And so they have been co-workers, close co-workers ever since. Um, there's some amazing esotericism about their relationship, but long story short, the Christ, the one who holds the office of the Christ now, will take over literally the vestments of the Buddha and as the Buddha goes on to a, a greater cosmic journey, very soon, maybe in the next couple of thousand years in the age of Aquarius, um, which also represents a blending of the earth chain and moon chain evolutions. That's another reason why there's so much conflict on this planet because of the different stages of evolution, the different types of karma, when the moon chain souls came in, in towards the middle of the Atlantean period, it caused a great disruption. But of course, there are many great things that happened in terms of marvelous technologies that were gifted to the race by the, by the guides of the race um, and expansion of consciousness and fabulous cities that were built and so forth. Um, but it got to a point in Atlantis, as I described in my book in the video, where the selfish appropriation of things by humanity um, using black magic and incantations and spells and so forth got to a point where the watching guides of the race had to, had to draw a line on the sand and say, this is the way of, of, of light and liberation this is the way of materialism and darkness. Humanity, make your choice. And that brought on the Atlantean War that is um, is uh, beautifully brought out in, in uh, the story of the Mahabharata, particularly the Peter Brook film version, which was a stage play for that went for nine hours originally uh, that they made into a movie in 1982, and which I have a clip from in, in my documentary, very moving part where Krishna is is talking to um, uh, his his disciple uh, Arjuna, 
who is torn between the warring armies because he has to fight his family who have chosen the way of materialism and 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 he and Yudhishthira and all his other brothers are the are the representatives of the the choice of the way of light and are in fact archetypes for the sub races of the fifth root race uh, which is something I, I want to write about in the future so um, and within within that the Mahabharata is the golden kernel of the Bhagavad Gita um, uh -huh. and uh, such a a timeless story that is uh, appropriate for today as much as back then. So um, there is so much that is hidden in all these, uh, as I said before, the Aegis wisdom encoded in the religious scriptures and traditions um, or in, in every culture. And some of them are almost identical or similar to one another. So um, again, I come back to this point that that the masters of wisdom withdrew in that at that conflict four million years ago. It's extraordinary passages that I've I've read in the Bailey books about this um, that that really raise your eyebrows. You, you go, wow, <laughs> what a what a period of time! You can only imagine what it must have been like, um, where the the divine plan was basically thwarted, was again held back by the materialistic forces, and now. Humanity, uh, excuse me, hierarchy, the Great White Brotherhood uh, are um, planning to to come back virtually now. You know, we're we're in this period of the of, of the forerunner. Um, so in the next few decades, perhaps, maybe even earlier than we know. I know many people are certainly trying to invoke that because of mm -hmm. perilous state they that they uh, are experiencing with the world at the moment so uh, all these factors are contributing to where we are now this extraordinary uh, milestone that we find ourselves at today and um, and so it goes and in, in the next few thousand years I mentioned in the documentary and in the book there'll be many earth changes there'll be increasing volcanic activity the fifth root race has reached its acme, as I said before, uh, and will run for about another 400 or 500,000 years. The sixth root race, in a sense, has already started, is overlapping, of course, as do all the cycles in terms of the spiralic notion of time. And, um, and so uh, the fifth root race will be destroyed by fire, just as the fourth root race was destroyed by water, the third root race was destroyed by fire as well. Um, and that fire will be through volcanic action, earthquake activity and so forth, which will cause sinkings and so forth. But essentially, fire is related to the mind and is the, is the destructive element that will bring, back, bring about the destruction of the fifth root race that is, has developed mind to such a high degree. Um, water being a symbol of the emotions, of course, which was the for the most of the Atlantean population was the, the highest level of, of um, consciousness unfoldment that, that was brought about except for the other, the high initiates of that time. So um, we will see, as you said before, Britain will sink beneath the waves entirely. In, in fact, it's already sinking if you look at the flood, flood plans for the next 50 years that are increasing in, in Britain. Uh, it's, it's already being inundated um, as will other continents um, sink uh, or parts of them will sink and uh, other parts will be raised. And when other parts are raised, they'll be parts of the old Atlantean continent that we haven't seen yet that will have on them ruins and artifacts that we've yet to discover. This will be occurring in the next few thousand years as well as we go into towards the sixth root race. So a great synthesis is occurring now in consciousness and also in language. There will be a universal language, it's not unlike the fact that English is a kind of de facto universal language right now, but there will be, um, we will eventually again speak with one tongue instead of so many fragmented tongues, and that one tongue will, will be about the unification of consciousness as well. We will truly enter the, the golden age and those golden and bronze ages and so forth 
as I explain in the book, correspond to the yugas, the Hindu yugas, the Satya yuga is the golden age and so forth and so on. Um, mm -hmm. And each root race has its golden age, it has its iron age. We are currently in the Kali yuga or the iron age right now, the death and destruction of all that has occurred in the last four million years. That's what we're looking at, but we're also overlapping this period right now is the start of the Satya Yuga, the golden age for the sixth root race, which will take about, uh, well, um, several million years to unfold, put it that way. It's it's like a, what's the word, um, more in the etheric, you know, it's a more subtle uh, cause of the eventual form that will that will be more visible in the next few million years. Uh, Wait, no, I'm next... looking. I'm looking at. You know, we we have we have at least one um, super volcano here um, in the United States, and it, it it's due to go off. And when it does, it will certainly change the top, topographic. You know, the the it'll it'll change yeah. the the face of the United States when it goes off. Um, yeah. But I'm seeing more, more I'm seeing more earthquakes. Yeah, Yellowstone, and and but but there's also a, a fault line that goes down just at the um, New Madras fault line that goes down kind of almost the Mississippi. That's due to go, go off too. So I'm seeing a lot of the geological changes um, starting to happen now. Yes, that's true. If they are. And even California, will, parts of California will fall into the sea, Blavatsky says, I think, somewhere, or maybe the Tibetan says that. Um, and, of course, they've been waiting for the big one for a long time. Uh, it's overdue, in fact, in places like San Francisco and, and um, yeah. in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Los Angeles and so forth. Um, these, these, uh, these are cyclical changes, though, as well, you know, um, and and they reoccur, uh, and especially during periods, cuspal periods that we're at at the moment. Um, you mentioned before the, the changing of the poles. That happens about every one million and one million and fifty thousand years. I have a little section about that in my book. Um, mm -hmm. And there is a kind of a gradual movement of the poles, and then there is at some point a kind of major flip. That, that takes yeah. place that that would be the extremely disorienting geographically and and physically for for the world's population. Um, I'm not sure when I worked out the next one was going to be happening. Uh, um, not in our lifetimes, I don't think. <laughs> Although we do know that the magnetic <laughs> pole has shifted right across um, uh, oh, yeah. somewhere across Russia right now. So, yeah, it's, um, it, and, and at one yeah. point it was at Hudson Bay. So. You know that that's a mm. long chain. Oh, that's but, yeah. um, but again, it takes yeah. it takes it uh, takes millions of years for it to shift. Yeah. But I think there's there's um, a a tomb in each there's a tomb in Egypt that on the ceiling, it has the um, the night sky completely reversed, and. You know, they, they couldn't understand how the Egyptians could get it wrong, and I, they didn't get it wrong. Um, the, the poles had flipped, and the night sky was different at that time frame, which means they have yes. to, to recalibrate the age of that particular tomb. But, um, yeah, it's so exciting. I mean, what, what's, what's really exciting is that your information gives people a better understanding as to, you know, the process that, that has been ongoing for millions and millions of years. And the frustrating thing is that, that we only see a small part of it so that, so that we don't see the big picture. And your book and your video help to give people an understanding of what the big picture actually is. And, you know, the, our spirits are immortal. We will reincarnate over and over and over again. We'll see it all, but it just won't be in, in the body we're in now, hopefully. Indeed. I, I, and, I mean, there, there is a cutoff point, though, Barbara. We, we, when we do get to the point of liberation, taking the higher initiations, 
we get to choose the next path to tread, the so-called uh -huh. seven cosmic path, the fourth path of which is the path to Sirius, and we're told that the bulk of Earth humanity will choose that path eventually, once they've gone beyond the fourth or fifth initiations, which are, you know, become liberated and perfected as such. Your, your soul or causal body is destroyed and you become one with the, your essential essence, which is called the monad or the spirit. Um, and so I talk about, when I discuss the globes and chains and schemes, the cycling of the of human monads through those schemes over immense periods of time where they actually go through the experience of each kingdom, the mineral kingdom. So we've been through all those kingdoms, the animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, and at individualization, the, the, um, the human kingdom came into being and, and the kingdom of souls, really. Um, as though as those uh, animal bodies became animated by consciousness. This is a great mystery. And I discuss this amazing passage in one of the Tibetans' uh, writings about um, the great electrical storm that ensued when um, the, uh, the part was, was uh, infused with higher consciousness uh, coming from beings that resided on a within the Earth scheme, but on a different globe of the Earth scheme, which is called the Venus globe. And this what you probably saw that remember that part of the the angels flying through space in the video uh, was trying mm -hmm. to depict that. But um, and I speculate whether that period of time how long that went for. Did it go for a, for a few weeks, 100 years, 5,000 years? It's hard to figure out, but that was the actual death of the dinosaurs at that time, um, which differs from the exoteric figure of about 60 million years ago. Uh, I, I propose that it was at this individualization period about 21 million years ago, where the death of all forms, in fact, practically all forms on the planet were destroyed at individualization with this, this huge influx of electrical force that was the new consciousness that humanity... And so what it, what it, uh, it forced humanity to, to reincarnate, but not as, as, as members of the animal kingdom anymore, but as members of the conscious, consciously evolving human kingdom. That's kind of it in a nutshell to try, try and break it down in, really, in a very simplistic way. Um, I find that this time of individualization, I come back to it again and again and again because all the mysteries of the planet uh, are kind of contained in that period of time, I think, in, in uh, microcosm. I think one of the things that, that I found very interesting was that you, you made it very clear that we did not evolve from the apes, but that the apes evolved from us. And yes. that, that, that makes more sense, actually. It does make a lot of sense, doesn't it? I mean, it reverses the, the currently held scientific view. Um, we have a far more divine pedigree than, than that. The apes were the offspring of humans breeding with animals at the time. Yeah of Lemuria when the, the sacral center of the lower chakras were, were, was the point of least resistance. So um, uh, after individualization, uh, this occurred and, and it, um, it deviated from the, the planetary purpose and plan. And we are told in the secret doctrine that those races were struck with sterility. Um, and yet, the apes, the sin was repeated again, so to speak, uh, in Atlantean times on a, on a higher turn of the consciousness spiral, which was even worse in many ways. So the modern apes today are the remnants of, of that time, a reminder of our transgressions, um, particularly the orangutan, chimpanzees, the uh, gorillas. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, we have um, places like Madagascar um, about 80 different 
species of lemurs, lemur as in Lemuria, um, and Madagascar was a part of ancient Lemuria that stretched from the African, or what we now call Africa, uh, right across the Indian Ocean to Australia and beyond. So um, it does make much more sense. And once science picks that up sometime in the Aquarian age to come and runs with that, they'll find, I think, a lot of solutions will, will fall into place. Um, you know, um, and this also applies to the primitive races that we see on the planet. Um, they've all, there's always been primitive races or, or unevolved races um, that have been around with the more evolved races. Um, and the other part of this is one of the things that confuses um, researchers is is in, in the way they look at things linear linearly um, plus also the artifacts and ruins uh, of of past civilizations are all mixed up together they're not all from one time and they can be yeah. in one ruin in one place can be easily confused uh, with another ruin that's that's like a few hundred thousand years uh, older um, for instance, the, the, when you go to the, the Giza Plateau in, in, in Cairo, uh, you're looking at the Great Pyramid, which Blavatsky says is about 85,000 years old or something like that. I'm probably got the wrong the number wrong, 78,000 or something like that, I think it is. Um, and then you, you, you go over and look at some of the other pyramids like the Bent Pyramid and so forth and straight away you can see they're so much more older, you know, maybe 400 or 500,000 years old uh, in my guesstimation. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, but <laughs> in the exoteric history they're all 3000 BC. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then you have sorts of things that people rely on which are a, a dodgy ways to, to, to create chronology, such as carbon dating, uh, is uh -huh. very flawed. I have a section about that in my, in my book. Um, all these dating systems uh, are flawed in one way or another, uh, but they will get better, I hope. Um, and maybe they will synthesize with one, with one another to, to create a better system. But so many researchers regard the those figures as gospel, like the results from a horse race or something, you know. Um, and they're not. <laughs> they're they're, they're yeah. totally inaccurate and they're based on, on human illusory ideas. So, well, I think um, that, that, you know, they everybody wants everything put in a nice little package and wrapped up and filed in, 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 a, in a drawer with the appropriate name. And that's just not how it's, how it is and is ever going to be because the, the more we learn, picture. the more we know. Yes. This is the nature and, of the concrete and, mind that wants to, you know, yeah. it's part of the, the shadow of, of where we are. Well, yeah, but it, the concrete mind restricts you and if you let it loose, you know, ma magic happens and, and the potential and the possibilities you know, for us to grow and learn are just, you know, beyond belief. And, and I think people should check out the Great White Brotherhood if you haven't. Uh, it's all over the Internet. Um, I just have noticed our time, which is getting very, 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 very small. And I want you to be able to give out all the information on, on where people can find your material and find you and stuff like that. So why don't you, you know, take a deep breath and let people know how to find you and <laughs> and where your material is. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Barbara. Um, uh, the Great White Brotherhood uh, material can be found in my book called Masters of the Seven Rays, one of the first books that I read, uh, wrote uh, that you can find on Amazon. If you're a U.S. Uh, customer, you can buy it straight off my website and get a discount, 15% discount. Um, all my 14 or 15 books are on, on my on my website and on, on Amazon. Uh, I've got three new ones coming out as a result of the last three years of writing. It's the most writing I've ever done, I think. Um, and I'm editing now. They should be out in 2022. But um, 
you you know my website is turkastrologer.org. I have a YouTube channel. I'm I'm going to be going diversifying into other channels like Rumble and Odyssey soon. Um, and I have newsletters going back 20 years on my website. It's a treasure trove of, of um, articles uh, from other people as well as myself, but, but mainly myself these days. I, I hardly get uh, a chance to, to do. There's so much editing and maintenance to do on the website. So um, but a lot of material there, and all that my, yeah, all that material is in my books plus other essays that I've written along the way. So yeah, that's that's the main area. And if you want a reading from me, you can go to my website as well, of course. And uh, there's a, a part of the menu there that there's astrological consultations or something like that, and you can um, purchase a reading and um, and I can tell you how to go from there. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, my channel has has videos from conferences as well uh, it has a few PowerPoint presentations I do have a few of them at the workshops weekend workshops that you can buy on on my website uh, which are like weekend workshops of uh, one day of esoteric astrology and another day of, of esoteric history for instance um, yeah pretty much covers it I think Wow. <laughs> well, I, I will just I I will add to it that 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 uh, unveiling Genesis Mysteries of the Root Races and Cycles is a phenomenal book. If you are a student of of spirit growth and consciousness, this is a book you need to read. And um, you know, I would tell you buy it, and if you read it and don't think you needed it, I would pay for it. But I'm not going to do that. But but. I feel so strongly about it that you know, it, it's an amazing book. It's a book you can you can read for the rest of your life and, and learn every day. So, um, and, and yeah. his his video is 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 beautifully done. So please check out the website and check out the book. Um, Philip, thank you so much for being here and and for being a good sport about having to call back in and stuff like that. But but your material is so important. Uh, I am so thrilled that you were here, and I thank you so very, very much. Um, I want to thank everybody else for listening. Um, there are um, going to be a couple of great shows next week, and uh, I, I highly encourage you to check us out on YouTube. We're on Rumble. We're on YouTube. We're on 20 different servers. So all you have to do is type in Nightlight, and you'll find us. And if you do hit us on YouTube and you enjoy what you see, please subscribe because that's how we know you're listening. So thanks so much, everybody. This has been an exciting show. I, I can't tell you how important I think this book is. And so consider looking at it. Check it out for sure. Uh, and uh, thanks again for being here. Have a great one. Stay healthy, stay happy, and stay conscious. Bye-bye now. <laughs>